Snow is surprisingly hot, and this heat can kill. Avalanches kill about 150 people every year. But one of the biggest mysteries is how the shape of a tiny snowflake can cause something as deadly and powerful as an avalanche. Okay, it might sound unbelievable, but let's start from the beginning. You might imagine a typical snowflake like this, but there are actually over 35 different types of snowflakes. As a snowflake falls, it can change its shape and size multiple times. And all this is possible because snow exists almost always near its melting temperature. What does that mean? Well, it means it's considered a hot material, so it's always undergoing some kind of phase change, like from solid to liquid, solid to vapour, or liquid to vapour. So what's this got to do with avalanches? Well, all these changes to the shape of a snowflake mean it can become much more dangerous once it hits the ground. So when we look out at the snow, it seems like it's just a, a uniform blanket, but that's not the case. If we look inside the snowpack, we see that it's formed of many discrete layers. It's layers, we might see some layers that look like those beautiful snowflakes that fall out of the sky. Other layers might be small and rounded and well bonded. And then we might have some weak layers that tend to be large angular grains that are pretty loose. And that's the thing. The shape of a snowflake or a crystal can make a layer either strong or weak. And the most dangerous avalanches have this weak layer. One way to imagine it is like a row of wine glasses, all stacked on top of each other. They might be relatively stable by themselves, but as the layer of snow above gets thicker and thicker, as dense as a row of bricks being stacked on top of the glass, eventually that weak layer will break. This is when we get the avalanche. Of course there are a few other ingredients that contribute. The angle of the slope is important, about 39 degrees is the avalanche sweet spot, a thick layer of snow on top, and also we need some type of trigger, and usually that's us, regular humans who trigger 90% of all avalanche disasters. But still, the most important ingredient of all is that invisible weak layer, the hidden killer below the surface. Avalanche workers are tracking weak layers throughout the season, and if an avalanche occurs, the first question you're always asking the other avalanche worker is, which weak layer did it run on, and how deep was that weak layer buried? So what is it that creates these deadly weak layers? It's heat. So weak layers form in the snowpack due to temperature gradients, and Oftentimes, large temperature gradients are present in the snow because the ground surface is almost always near zero degrees C, whereas the air temperature above at the top of the snowpack can be significantly colder than that. Those temperature differences cause the movement of water vapor, and as it moves, it forms these large angular crystals that don't bond easily to each other, and therefore become weak layers. So there are three main types of weak layer that cause the most concern for avalanche experts. Depth hoar, surface hoar, and near surface facets. First on the list is depth hoar, or sugar snow. Its snow grains grow like inverted cups that are stacked up on top of each other. You can almost see them just with your naked eye. You put your hand into the snow pit wall and it just comes pouring out like sugar and you have these big sparkly grains. And this is a type of weak layer that's responsible for most of the avalanche fatalities. Depth hoar forms at the, at the ground snow interface. Generally means that the entire snowpack um, is engaged in the avalanche. Surface hoar is the pretty one, and you might even recognize this one. The conditions that form surface hoar are the same sorts of conditions that put frost on your car windshield. So if you find yourself in the morning Scraping the frost off of your car windshield with your scraper, you probably could find surface hoar on the snowpack. These snow grains look like bird feathers sticking up out of the snow surface. The problem is that when we have all these crystals lined up, it resembles a house of cards, and it acts like one too. So when more and more weight piles on top, the house of cards collapses, and there's an avalanche. The final one is near surface facets, aka recycle powder, or loud powder. Because it tends to be very fun to ski, you almost sound like you're skiing through little crystals because you can hear the snow breaking. But that breaking is also what can make it dangerous. These are small angular crystals of about a millimeter in size and they tend not to bond well with crystals around them. 
That's why they're loose and sugary, and also why they form weak layers. So that's why understanding more about these weak layers is at the cutting edge of avalanche science. It all comes down to the strange properties of these beautiful, delicate little snowflakes, and how their shape can be formed and morphed by the heat around them.